and uh, David's been teaching for over 10 years now. He's worked in China and Poland. He's currently in Portugal uh, at IH Coimbra. He's talked at quite a few of our online conferences. Um, he's also a, a, a blogger. He has his own blog at uh, tefelgeek.net where you can find lots of uh, his fantastic posts about ELT matters. He's particularly interested in exams and technology. Although, uh, he did a, a fantastic talk about reading in exam classes. He's also Delta qualified and he's just finished an MA in Applied Linguistics. So he's going to be sharing all that knowledge with us now as he talks about learner behavior changes with a nudge and a wink. So over to you, David, and to enjoy the workshop, everybody. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, the, yeah, uh, so the talk with a nudge and a wink, helping learners change their behaviors. Um, where I struggle uh, in my teaching is often with uh, learner behaviors, thinking particularly about not only in-class behaviors, so you know, small children hitting each other, uh, but also learners who don't sort of exhibit or don't want to do the right kind of learning behavior. What by, by that, I guess what I mean is, um, I think we all know that if you read more widely, if you um, sort of uh, practice your vocabulary every day, or you know, there's there's a number of different learning strategies that you can use to maximise your learning. Um, and uh, I'm not going to be talking about any of those, um, but I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the things why why people choose not to do these things, or whether indeed it is a choice, okay? So the inspiration for this talk um, has come from uh, Dan Ariely. Um, my colleague Dave Cosby first uh, clued me into these uh, two TED Talks that Dan Ariely has given. Uh, they're both very popular and uh, highly recommended um, if you have time after uh, this session to go and have a look at them. Uh, the first one on the left, you can see, are we in control of our own decisions? So he looks at the irrationality, the irrationality of, um, of our decision-making process. Um, and in the second one, he talks about what motivates people to do good work. Now, being something of an a, of a ELT fanatic, I watched these and immediately started thinking, well, how can we apply these uh, ideas to our teaching and our education? Um, Dan Ariely's also written a book, um, Predictably Irrational. He's actually written more than one book. Um, but this book is the one that formed the basis of the first TED Talk, um, Are We in Control of Our Decisions? Um, so as I, as I watched um, Dan's talks, there were sort of four key areas that um, came out of, of what he said for me um, that I, I think are applicable to to our teaching, um, and these, as you can see, are choice, meaning, acknowledgement, and pride. And uh, these four themes um, form the basis of this talk. Uh, so we're going to be looking at each one in turn um, and looking at uh, what it means for us and how we can practically, uh, how it can practically affect um, what we do in the classroom or our behavior with our learners. Okay, so uh, first of all, we have choice. So, uh, question of choice looking at how we make our choices, what influences the choices that we make, um, and what our choices are, I guess. So, uh, to begin with, I'd like to try a little experiment for you all. Um, so, uh, a poll which is now open. So, quick question for you. Would you like a tea, a coffee, or a glass of water? Just gonna write these results down. Now, fairly evenly split there. Okay. <laughs> Glass of wine, yes. I believe, Jenny, there is some uh, Sherapiga in the fridge, if you fancy that. Um, okay, excellent. If I'm going to end the poll there, 
and 16, 10, 18. Uh, and going to uh, open the next one. Okay. So if you'd like to make those choices again. Okay, I think we'll end that. Okay, right. Um, cappuccino with a double shot, yeah. Okay, fair enough. And uh, oh, done that one. Um, okay, so last one. Okay, unfortunately, this time it's going to cost you. Put that out there. So the price for these things is the same, it's one euro to each one. That's interesting. Okay, excellent. So there, there's the results. I'm just writing these down. Okay, you'll be glad to know that you've completely confounded my expectations of your choice making there. So <laughs> you, um, yeah, okay, never mind. <laughs> It's an experiment. It didn't entirely go as I thought it was uh, going to. But never mind. Okay, the point behind um, these these polls and the whole point behind the choices uh, is that generally speaking, the more complex the um, oops, sorry, don't want that. Uh, the more complex we um, the more complex the choice that is available to us, the more difficult it is to make that decision. So polls one and two, where you're being asked to um, uh, being asked to tea, coffee, or a glass of water, and then uh, tea in a red mug, tea in a blue mug. Basically, in the second poll, the the decision that you're being asked to make is more complex. And according to Dan Ariely's uh, theories and the evidence from his experiments, which I'm assuming are slightly more scientific than um, than, than this. Um, suggests that when you get a more complex decision process, people tend to default to the simple option. And so, you know, in the, what I was hoping the polls would show is in the first one, you've got the choice between tea, coffee and a glass of water. And I was expecting a fairly even split, which is what we've got, because I think uh, 18, 10 and 18. And then in the second one, where you had the more complex decisions to make, um, the poll was still fairly evenly split. In between coffee and tea, it was 17, 12, and 18, I think. So yeah. not too, not too bad. But the idea behind the complex decision versus the simple decision it is what explains uh, things like this. I'm sure if you, you you've all go gone to um, you know, various uh, websites where you subscribe. Um, and then you get endless emails from these websites. This is one that, that arrived in my inbox the other week uh, from classcharts.com. Um, I have nothing against classcharts. I don't actually use them. I investigated them, but I, I never got around to actually using them with my class yet. Um, but the um, the 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 sorry the interesting bit is the unsubscribe bit at the at the bottom. One of the things that Ariely points out is that the the decision to unsubscribe involves you considering a range of different factors. So you're thinking about what the, the consequences of um, subscribe uh, sorry the consequences of unsubscribing are, what the opportunities are for you if you stay with uh, stay with receiving these things. And what the advantages and disadvantages are. So you're basically sort of assimilating all this information, thinking it over in your head, and then finally uh, you come to a conclusion. Now that's much more complex. It involves much more time and effort on your part than simply doing nothing, which is what's yeah the easiest option. 
So this is why you will have noticed over the last few years that a lot of these things have changed from being if you want to subscribe to a project, click here, to if you want to unsubscribe, click here. So we've moved from the opt-in option to the opt-out option, um, simply because of uh, people realizing that the complexity of choice affects the decision making. So the summary is that simple options tend to be complex options. Um, easy beats difficult. Doing nothing beats doing what is easiest. And then generally speaking, we tend to go with the flow. We tend not to, to do uh, anything that is more complex. Okay. Now, if I think about how that relates to my classroom, I think that it explains the reaction I get whenever I say to my exam students that we're going to do a writing activity. Because if you think about the complexity that is involved in students crafting a written response to something, it's, it's incredibly detailed. There's huge numbers of factors to consider uh, in them creating their, their written text. And let's face it, you know, doing an exercise from the course book is probably a lot easier for them. Um, and I think that also, to an extent, explains the continued popularity of course books. Course books represent the default option. They represent the, the easy choice, because there is no choice. You do the next exercise in your course book. Um, and I think from that perspective, it also explains teachers' exasperation with course books, because while it is the default option and it's the easiest thing, it doesn't necessarily represent what uh, the learner's needs are. Um, but, I mean, you know, I, for example, yesterday was looking at what to do with my CAE class and I was looking at what was in the book and thinking, I know that this is the default option and I don't want to do it, but it, at the end of the day, is going to be easier or some variation thereof is going to be easier. Okay. Um, now, if we go, if we think back to, just go back a minute, uh, this poll, um, you might be, you might think that um, tea and a biscuit, coffee, coffee and a biscuit, well, what's the point of having the coffee there? It costs the same amount, but you don't get as much as either the tea, uh, tea and a biscuit or as much as the coffee and a biscuit. And, and the reason for this is because option B, the coffee, is what's referred to as the useless option. Wait, too far, sorry, too far. Um, and the useless option isn't useless um, because it guides our decision-making process. Um, if you've got coffee versus coffee and a biscuit, coffee and a biscuit immediately looks better than just coffee. But what's interesting is, that, again, according to Ariely's research, um, I think when we did our little experiment, the yeah again you confounded expectations. Um, but um, Ariely's research says that coffee and a biscuit not only looks better to coffee, but coffee and a biscuit because of that positive comparison starts to look better than tea and a biscuit. And um, obviously the evidence from from this experiment would not uh, agree with that, but never mind. Um, so the the useless option, um, I think, has ha, can have an impact in in um, our classroom teaching as well. Uh, if you know you ask your students, um, do you want to do speaking? Do you want to do some grammar and vocabulary? Or do you want to do some speaking and vocabulary? They, it, it reframes that choice in terms of the speaking looking better than just. Uh, the um, sorry, the speaking and the vocabulary looking better than just the speaking, therefore it looks more positive than the grammar and vocabulary. So it is a way that you can potentially guide your your classes and your students into doing what they they need, um, into doing what they need rather than what they want. Um, so, okay. Default settings, I've already talked a little bit about the, the, the course book being um, one of our default settings. It's certainly my, one of my default settings. Um, I know very much that I, I get stuck in a rut um, sometimes, and I have a bunch of defaults which are probably the best. And I think 
you know, it, it's probably a tribute to myself to training all those many years ago um, that the uh, the default settings are still very kind of PPP presentation based. Um, they are teacher focused in the presentation, learner focused, I guess, a little bit in the um, uh, in the practice activities. But you know, the default, I think, is the book. Um, it's the the presentation. It's being uh, teacher fronted, teacher centered. I don't know if, if anyone agrees with me. What are your um, what do you think your pedagogical default settings are? Take take a moment and answer in the chat box. I'm have some coffee without a biscuit. Yeah, that's interesting. Actually, Paula's point there, reaction to behavior is quite a good one. Um, that's, again, something that I think I've been trying to work on recently. It's um, the way that, you know, you have to sort of just stop yourself thinking whether or not what the students, whether the behavior of the student is actually going to be a problem or whether it, whether it even matters um, what they're doing. Um, is the is what you are your expectations reasonable? Um, it's quite quite an interesting one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Looking at the same procedures for listings and readings. Power. Okay. Lots of power. Okay. It's nice to see so many familiar names there in the chat box. Um, okay. So these may be what our default settings are. But I wonder what our default settings should be. Now, obviously, you know, what you think our default settings should be will depend on your beliefs on teaching and learning. Um, so these are perhaps more reflective of uh, where I am in my teaching practice at the moment than um, saying that these are um, things everybody should be striving to achieve. Um, but yeah, when I think about what I want my students to do, then um, I, I tend to want them doing something. I want it to be sort of more task-based. I want them to be interested in what they're doing. Um, I want them to be finding out what they can do with the language. Um, and I want, I, yeah, I want it all to be about them. I, I really don't want to be doing very much in the classroom at all. Um, and yeah, that they should be using the language, not just practicing it, but using it. So these, 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 I think, are some of the defaults that um, I would like to make into my default settings rather than just reacting to, to what's given to me and going with the default option of the book. And it is difficult, but I think if you, if you try and flip your default settings into something that is um, something that you want to achieve rather than something that is provided for you, um, so, um, how do you think maybe we can do this with our learners? Um, we can hand over the choice to them. Um, sorry, there's a duplication of the question there. Because, um, yeah, uh, okay. So, uh, but yeah, asking asking the um, asking the students what what they want to do. Um, hand hand over the choice to the learners. I mean, does it doesn't really matter who works with who. Sometimes, yes, maybe, if you've got young learners. Um, like there's one young man in one of my classes who is not allowed to sit anywhere near one of the other young men in my classes. Um, but, um, yeah, who do you want to work with? Um, does it, you know, let, let them work with who, whoever they want. Um, maybe you can uh, ask them to make sure they work with everybody during the course of uh, during the course of a week, um, or uh, the course of two weeks, or however long you've got. Um, 
asking them if they want to use the book today or not. Um, again, the book might represent the default setting, it represents the simplest option, but uh, do they want to... Um, yeah, what do they want to do in class today? Um, we, you, can, you can sort of re, you can redirect what's going on in the classroom recording just, just by asking them what, what they want to do, I think. Um, and so I'm looking at Matt's comment in the chat box. Not, uh, not just asking, but accepting the first answer. Do you mean not accepting the first answer that gets shouted out and actually taking a poll from everyone or just going with whatever the first person says? So, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> all right. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, we, you know, all of my students come into the classroom and they always tend to sit in the same places. They have a default, they have a default seating plan of their own. I don't tell them where to sit, but they go there and they do that themselves. As a result of which, they do tend to get default partners as well. They, they tend to talk more to the person that's sitting directly next to them, unless I make a point of um, moving them around. So their, their seating is default, their partners are default, the interactions they have in the, the classroom are default, the materials that they use in, in the course book or copies of workbook handouts tend to be default, and um, we settle, I think, into a default set of routines as well. And I think just shifting that around a bit and, um, um, and yeah, maybe handing the choice over to them is, is one way that you can, uh, you can uh, manage that. Um, okay, now coming back to the useless option again, um, I wonder if you can spot in, in these two questions which ones are the useless options. And from my perspective, I think um, in the one on the, the, the question about the writing lesson, doing some time practice is um, is my sort of, yeah, that seems to be the one that students go for most. Um, in the one on the right, the lang practicing the language, then I think uh, the default setting might be exercises from the book. But um, by framing the questions like this, hopefully you can, you can get your students to realize that there are other possibly better alternatives to doing something and to developing rather than, um, again, just going with the default with the exam practice. Um, so right, picking up on the limited choice, free choice situation. Yes, the if you obviously students come into the classroom with their own expectations of what's going to happen, and they don't expect to be given a choice. In my experience, anyway, and they expect that the teacher is the authority, and the teacher is going to tell them what to do. So perhaps one aspect of learner training is building them up to making these choices for themselves. If you give them a choice where, as we've seen here, you've got a multiple choice option, um, then initially you can just go with what they say, but maybe in a future lesson you can ask them the same question, get them to analyze what the advantages and disadvantages of each option are, so that at least then they're making an informed choice. And I think once they start making informed choices about their learning, then it's better for them because, you know, if they're making an informed choice, then, then hopefully their learning will be more effective. Okay, um, I'm going to move on because I'm just very aware of the time. I'm not used to speaking for 45 minutes. Um, so the second point we highlighted in, um, from Dan Ariely was uh, uh, meaning and the meaningful uh, condition. So I'd like to do another quick experiment, please. However, for this experiment, you will need um, pen and paper, or pencil and paper, your choice. Um, and either very good math skills or a calculator. Um, if you're watching this on a computer, you should be able to use the calculator option without interfering too much with what you see in front of the screen. Okay, so I'm going to give you just a minute to, to get yourselves together for that. Okay, so um, think of a number. If you've got your number, maybe write it down. Don't tell me what it is. Don't tell me what it is. Ah, 
not looking. Um, multiply your number by three. Okay, we've all managed that so far. Now multiply the result of that by itself. So if your initial number, for example, was two and you multiplied it by three, you would have had six. So this should be six times six. Okay. This is where it starts to get complicated. Add the digits together until you reach a single digit. So if you've got 356, you would have three plus five is eight, plus six is 14. 14, 1 plus 4 equals 5. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, if you've got 5, as your example here, and so you've got 5 here and a 5 here, you put a 1 in front of this one and a 2 in front of this one, giving you 15 and 25. Multiply them together. Okay, everybody done that? Okay, multiply the result of that by five. See, this is getting into advanced calculus now. Okay. Right, now multiply each digit of the number that you've got together. So again, if you currently have uh, 257, you would have 2 times 5 is 10, times 7 is 70. I think. Okay. Right. Now, I think I can guess your answer, at least if you've done it correctly, um, or if I've done it correctly. I think your answer, the number you currently have in front of you, is 350. Am I right? You've done it wrong, Neil. See? There you go. I've learned how to read the minds of 92 people around the world, or however many people there are. Uh, around the world. Yeah? Okay, if you want to know why that's important, you can go to the website, again, after the talk, thinkofanumber.net, which will um, explain um, why 350 is a very important number around the world. Okay, um, having done that, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, how do you feel about that activity? Are you impressed? Was it fun? Did you enjoy it? How much effort do you think you put into that? Did you get um, Did you get much out of doing it? And why did you do it? Until you got the wrong answer. Oh, well, never mind. You can try again, Neil. Go to the website later and do it again. Um, okay, what do you think the point in doing it was? It was indeed a challenge. Mm. Yeah, there was absolutely no point in doing that activity. It's a waste of your time. And yeah, it shows you how bad at maths you are. Um, how do you feel now? No, 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 well, okay, I mean, Right. From my perspective, this activity does have a purpose. There's a reason why I've asked you to do this, and the reason is to demonstrate um, how you feel and how students might feel when they don't understand what the point of something in, that you're doing in the lesson is. Um, so, you know, you might feel, having gone through all that effort to do all of the mathematics and then find that you didn't need to do it at all, you might feel a bit frustrated, you might feel a bit annoyed, particularly if you've got the wrong answer. 
Um, and so, well, why? What was the point of investing all of that time and effort into doing it? And there wasn't one. Um, and the point is that when we do something, we invest ourselves in it. And, and by and large, we care about what we do, particularly if we think it's important or, um, or if it has meaning for us. Um, and conversely, we put more time and effort into those things that we think are more meaningful. Um, so the question then obviously becomes, how can you make things more meaningful um, for, for your students? Um, here are some of my ideas. Um, you know, they're not the only answers, obviously. Um, but I think if you can uh, get a negotiated syllabus with the learners, then that, that's basing what you're doing in the classroom around things that they have um, uh, they have chosen to do in the classroom. Um, then I think obviously you. You know, what you're doing is going to be more meaningful for more of the students. Um, this may well conflict with um, uh, syllabuses or, or curricula that have been imposed upon you from elsewhere. For example, if your school has a syllabus that uh, uh, they want you to follow, or if your curriculum is um, determined by your, your government, um, I think in language teaching, you can get away with it because while you might need your, your students to cover certain language areas, they don't necessarily need to do that within the confines of a, of a, of a topic-based syllabus. I think you can negotiate the topic areas for the learners without necessarily compromising the language areas that you cover at the same time. Um, and theoretically, if the, if the teaching is good, um, and the learners are engaged and active, and chances are by the time they get around to doing any kind of test, they will have improved sufficiently that their performance on the test will be improved, if of course it's a good test. Um, and so you, know, you, you don't necessarily need to um, determine your syllabus by the test. Um, I think personalized learning if you if you can again you can you can sort of tailor things to individual goals, um, real world tasks. Um, I had quite an interesting conversation with uh, a group of um, thirteen and fourteen year olds the other week about the uh, Chinese state one child policy and the changes that are currently going through there, and we ended up having a fairly involved discussion on on the global population problem. Um, and they were really into it, they were really interested, they wanted to know more about it. Um, and it was just one of those nice opportunities where, you know, the, the, everything just kind of goes off in, in, a, in a direction and uh, the language is being used and, you know. Um, but they were really involved in it. And they were much more involved in that conversation than they were in the, um, uh, the, the context that had been presented in the book. Um, giving students tasks and, and concepts to discuss that relate to the real world. Um, I think uh, it, it's, it's, it's really, well, it's, it's important. Um, at the end of the day, we are meant to be giving our students the skills to discuss the things that they discuss in their own languages in a foreign language. Um, here in Portugal at the moment, the economy is, is a constant source of um, conversation. Um, and so why not ask your students to solve the Portuguese economic problem? I mean, I'm sure they have ideas. Um, why not give them the language to be able to communicate these ideas? Um, and controversial topic areas, again, these are things that um, the course books tend to steer clear of. Um, PASNIP is the, the famous acronym that stands for politics, alcohol, religion, sex, uh, I can't remember what the N is now. Is that possibly, yeah, does anyone know what the N is? I can't remember. The I is isms, oh, narcotics, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, um, uh, I is isms, atheism, communism, and so forth, and the final P is uh, pork. Uh, so these apparently are things that we aren't allowed to talk about in, in our course books, and we're not meant to talk about with our students, and I don't understand why not. Um, 
you know, teenage boys are notorious for wanting to know all about um, sex and, and drugs and whatever else happens to, um, you know, yes, okay, fine, there is a context dependent there, um, and, you know, some areas, but I don't know, I mean, I worked in China where the state is meant to be controlling everything, and they were actually quite open about uh, discussions about politics and com communism and things like that. Um, yes, I think you, you have to be careful in that you have to know your learners, but again, I'm sure these are all topic areas that they discuss with each other, and I think as long as you have a certain amount of common sense, I don't see why you can't talk about these things with your classes. Um, on this area, I think the um, the the round the the uh, ELT self-publishing group was set up by Lindsay Clanfield have currently got a free offer. <coughs> pardon me. You can download uh, a free copy of their book Fifty Two uh, from their website, um, which I think is www.the-round.com. But I'm not sure. Um, and finally, yes, telling learners why they're doing something. I think, again, um, if they don't understand, um, uh, if they don't understand what the purpose of what they're doing is, then they're not going to even try it. If you can tell your, your group of young learners or your group of adults that the reason why they're doing this speaking activity is to practice uh, the present perfect or um, to, to get better at um, meeting people in a social situation, then they're more likely to do it than if you just ask them to get up and, and talk to each other. Uh, so lesson menus, when you, you write up what's going to happen in the lesson, if you write that up on the board, then that, that's a, a useful way of, of doing that. Um, okay, uh, again, being aware of time. Um, so the, uh, the next thing, let's talk about the acknowledgement uh, condition. Um, so, another question for you is, start a class and one of the students offers you a bit of paper. It turns out to be their homework, much to everyone's surprise. What do you do? Check it out the name one, yes. <laughs> ah, thank you, Jenny from Cordoba. Okay, uh, do you choose one of these these possible options? Tend to vary between the three. Sometimes the first one, sometimes the second one. Sometimes, depending on the student, the third one. Yeah. Okay. Um, mostly A, mostly B. Okay. And um, what what Dan Ariely's research shows is that simply just taking it um, has the same impact on people as tearing it up in front of them. And um, he calls this the acknowledgement condition. Um, the graph that you can see in front of you now um, is about the, the rates of pay that people would continue to work for, uh, determine, um, depending on, on uh, how their effort was acknowledged. So basically a lower number is a good number because people are prepared to work for longer at lower rates um, if, uh, if their work is acknowledged. Um, but what, what I think is interesting is that if you take their work and shred it, that has the same kind of psychological effect on people as just ignoring it. So if you just go around and you take people's homework um, while you're doing something else, then effectively you're, you're just ignoring them. You're ignoring all of the time and effort that the, the student has put into, um, uh, put into doing their homework. Um, even simply just looking at uh, the bit of paper in front of you and just going, uh-huh, is enough of an acknowledgement that the student will feel that their effort or their, um, their contribution has been valued. Um, and I think that's quite startling. And I think if you, you know, we've been talking about homework, but um, I think you can, you can look at other 
uh, other aspects of the classroom with that. Um, ignoring that for generally is demotivating. You think about all of the different uh, times that students do put effort into uh, your lessons. If, for example, they've just done a grammar practice exercise in, in their course book, um, and you look at it, and what do you do? Do you say anything? Do you thank them for doing that? Do you acknowledge good work? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, but I think what it shows is that giving feedback on the effort, the time and effort that the student has made in making the contribution is as important as actually feeding back on what they've done as well. Uh, so I think you've got, you've got sort of three three types of feedback now. You know, you, you, you've got acknowledgement feedback, content feedback, and uh, language feedback. Um, and, you know, I think it's just very important not to forget that first one. Um, if my exam class has uh, done a speaking activity and they've actually spoken English for the whole activity and um, it's been a good discussion, I think it's important to tell them that. It's like, you, know, you, you guys just sat there and you spoke English solidly for the last 10 minutes and you didn't make that many mistakes and I think you had a really good, uh, it was a really good activity. Thank you for your effort. Um, okay, uh, again, I'm just aware of time. So, sorry, just moving on to the last part then. Uh, oh, sorry, no, coming back. So, yeah, smiling, saying thank you, um, acknowledging the minimal. Um, yeah, there are some students who don't do very much, but I think if you can encourage them and say well done when they have done something, then they're more likely to do more the next time round. I'm thinking of one student in particular as I say this, um, and recognizing the effort of the mundane. Um, again, you know, if they're doing a reading task in their course books and uh, you know, they finish and they all do it, then great, say thank you, good effort, well done. Um, acknowledging, acknowledging what they do. Okay, uh, so just the last part then, looking at pride. Um, so here you go, here's a picture for you. What do you think of that? What, what artistic merits do you think that has? Would you like to see it on the wall of your National Gallery perhaps? Emotion. <laughs> yeah. It was drawn by a very young guy, this is true. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to see your talk, Chris. I was too busy trying to get a connection. It's not an angry teacher, it's a happy daddy. This is me, drawn by my four year old daughter. What do you think I said to her? when she showed me that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course I did. Uh, so, wow, is that me? Really? Ah, oh, excellent. Can I put that on the fridge, darling? And of course she was very proud of it. Um, why? Why do you think she was proud of it? Because it represents um, it represents time and effort. She she was proud of her, and yes, she managed to draw me. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, she takes pride in her work, and she values this work much more than you might. I mean, if you yeah, if you come across this bit of paper in the teacher's room, um, you might think, oh, that's cute. Some young man has done a nice little drawing. Um, but I'm not going to. I'm going to think, wow, that's me. My daughter did that. How cool. You know, the value of that piece of work for me is more than it might be to you. And the value of that piece of work for her is even more than it might be to me. Um, the, the reason, again, you know, when we put time and effort into something, we value our own contributions much more highly than we do uh, those of other people. Um, and the the more we um, the more time and effort we put into something, the higher the value we think that thing has. Uh, so another challenge for you: um, Do you think you can do this crossword? 
Do you think it's difficult? Yeah? What about this one? I was actually quite pleased with myself, because if you look, uh, which one was it? I can't, I can't see it now. It's not very easy to see. Oh yeah, uh, 10 across. Feeling of scorn in ads I'd read that. Disdain. It's an anagram. Um, <laughs> yeah, the second one is more complex. Um, and it's more challenging. And I think students who get something that is more cognitively challenging um, value the effort they put in. They value the result much more. Where you have more challenge, I think, um, then you, you can get your, your students to have more pride in something. So don't always default to the easy. Uh, make sure, I think something can be linguistically graded and still be cognitively challenging. Um, so, yeah, we tend to value what we put the effort into and yeah, the more the challenge we have, uh, the more we value the result. And obviously we aren't objective critics of our own work and I think that also has, yes, demand high. Uh, that, that also has implications in terms of the feedback that we give to learners. I think you have to be quite careful. If someone has really struggled and put time and effort into doing a piece of writing for homework, uh, you need to be quite careful about what you say about that writing. I don't, you, know, you, you, can't, um, you can't just dismiss it as, as being 12 out of 20, do better next time, think about the organization. Um, you, you have to really make sure you draw on the positive aspects of what, what the person has done as well. Um, so I think if we, we have challenging, uh, increasing challenge, um, increasing the cognitive challenge um, and putting doable demand into the things we do, I think uh, Chris mentioned it already, demand high. Uh, this is something um, that Adrian Underhill and Colin, no, Jim Scribner, Jim Scribner, um, uh, is that right? Yes, uh, have done on their the, the website Demand High ELT. You can find more information about that there. Um, classroom displays, recognizing the effort that people have put in, and helping them to have pride about the work they do, putting work up in the classroom. Uh, here in Coimbra, we have a masterpiece board where the best bits of um, uh, the best uh, work that well, teachers choose the best work from their classes and it all goes into a box and every now and again someone goes through the box and, and chooses stuff to go up and we, we have a nice big display board in reception so that all of the, uh, all of the uh, parents can see what wonderful work their students have done, their, their children have done. Um, and then finally I think reflective feedback where you ask the students to reflect on how they can do better next time. Uh, think about areas where they uh, might not be doing so well. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of running out of time here because we're going over for uh, the 45 minutes. So just to kind of reflect on the, um, the choice, meaning, acknowledgement and pride. Uh, okay, I'm going to, I think, finish up now um, and open things up for questions. Anyone has any? Or if there were any that I missed while, while we went through the chat box? Yeah, great stuff, David. Thank you very much for that. Has anyone got any questions for David? Just type them into the chat box. Or if anyone would like to come to the microphone, you could put your hand up and I will give you the privilege. Great stuff and lovely summary there of what you've been discussing, David. It was fascinating. <laughs> Lots of thanks and not many questions, David. Yep, that's good. So, <laughs> really great stuff, acknowledging your fantastic work. You can be very proud of yourself. <laughs> yes, thank you everyone for acknowledging it. That's good. You've given us lots of things to think about. <clears throat> Um, encouragement and lying. <laughs> <laughs>
Hmm. Yes, I would lie to my daughter completely. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about lying to students. I think if you, I, 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 don't know, I think honesty is usually the best policy in these situations. Um, but I think you, you know, there's there's ways of giving the feedback so that you're not necessarily lying, but so that you are encouraging the student to, to examine the the weaknesses of the whatever it is they've done. Um, I mean, you know, what one of my um, standard sort of answers with uh, young learners is. Um, um, if, if they're doing a, a practice activity, and usually there's uh, some students in the class who finish um, five minutes before the other students who at that point haven't even got their pencils out of their bag yet, um, but rather than giving feedback um, on which ones they've got right and which ones they've got wrong, I, um, I used to uh, sort of just look at what they've done and say, you've got three wrong. Um, but I think you can just flip that and say, okay, you've got seven right. And they go, seven, oh, okay. And then they, there's a pause and they go, wait, but there are 10 questions in that activity. And they go, yep, can you find the other more ones? Uh, go back and look at it again. Um, so just kind of flipping things like that. Um, does that answer the question, Mark? It's not really thing. lying, is it, David? I mean, when you're talking to your daughter. No, and it's encouraging. It is great what she's been doing. I think so, that's the point yeah, you're making. Hannah's got a great question. Be careful how you answer it, though, because uh, Hannah was one of my Dell T's, so I have uh, given her feedback. So, what do you think about using smiley faces? Uh, I I do do it. I, I have a, a kind of gradation of, of big smileys for excellent work, and then sort of slightly less smiley for for good work, and then kind of frowny faces for those that. Uh, might not be uh, quite so good, um, but again, I think it depends on the class and it depends on the students, um, and it depends on what what kind of feedback the, the students want. I mean, if you're if you're trying to encourage them just to do better, then you can put a smiley face. Um, I, I, I don't think that there's any problem with it. Uh, because I do. And it's given away I use them quite often. Although I, we tend to use them more to show that we're joking in the feedback rather than, uh, yeah, Sarah says using irony. Mm. Um, irony, Sean, it's irony, I think. Oh, right. sorry. Always confusing. Um, giving students the choice to choose tasks. Um, yes, I mean, I think, okay, not, not everybody's going to get what they want all of the time. Um, but as long as it doesn't end up with one person continually being marginalized by the others, then I don't think that's a problem. And I think also as teacher, you get the opportunity to direct that. So if you know, one student has perpetually had their choice rejected by the others, then I think you can just bring it in and say, well, okay, it's so-and-so's it's, it's turn to choose what we're going to do today. What do you want to do? Let's do that then. Um, just you know, be, be inclusive with it. And also, you can actually spend a lesson at the beginning or at different stages during the course discussing what they're going to do over um, a set of lessons, can't you, David? So it's not actually, you know, it's not taking up yeah, time every single class deciding who's doing what. They can plan the whole syllabus, not just the class. Yes. Okay, yeah. we're going to have to wrap you up there now, David, because okay. we're coming up to the hour. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you ever so much. It was a fantastic session, and it was great bringing up some questions. Remember that. Uh, David has a blog there, tefelgeek.net. You can talk to him on Twitter or Facebook, um, or of course pop into IH Coimbra. You can indeed, yes. yes. We're more than happy to welcome you here. If you do have more questions for David or would like to 